my colleague, Pat Mooney, who's lived a much longer now than I have, reckons that it takes roughly a human generation to understand the impacts of our technology. And I think he's probably being a bit short on that. I think it's something more like a, a human lifetime. Um, so I'm not really expecting we're going to get a very clear reading on synthetic biology tonight or anytime soon. But I am going to argue that that lag between deploying our technologies and understanding our technologies is a good reason why we should be supplementing the art of the long view with that policy of the long path, by which I mean the deliberate, careful path of precaution. Um, and I note that I've been uh, billed as a historian tonight, and that's uh, big shoes to fill, um, especially as I bunked off most of my history degree doing direct action. Um, but I'm going to try and not disappoint and to bring at least a few lessons from history, um, particularly lessons from the closest parallel that I can find, which is the synthetic chemical industry. And apart from the name and the fact that DNA synthesis is a chemistry technique, um, what these two, two fields share is they're both about building, synthesizing nature from standard molecular parts. Um, and indeed, the early um, chemists believed that they could uh, understand nature better by building it, just as Drew does. Um, but I think the parallel that we're looking at right now with synthetic biology is the mid-19th century when the synthetic chemists began to commercialize their field. And I just want to quickly show you how parallel those two moments are. So if you go back to 1856, uh, this was the time when a teenager in East London called William Henry Perkin, who was supposed to be synthesizing an anti-malarial drug, quinine, ended up synthesizing a, a, a synthetic dye, uh, movine. And realizing this was a red-hot commercial prospect, he uh, commercialized it, and a bunch of French, um, German, and uh, Swiss entrepreneurs, the sort of mid-19th century equivalent of Craig Venter or uh, Binod Kozler, copied his, uh, his business uh, model, and they, they also started producing synthetic dyes. And on the back of the synthetic dye industry, the modern chemical industry was born. Well, you zip forward 150 years, and just across the bay, Jay Kiesling is also trying to synthesize an anti-malarial compound, this time artemisinin, using biology. And he finds out that he can synthesize gasoline, he sets up a biofuels business, and people like Vinod Kozler and Craig Venter copy the idea, and uh, before you know it, you have a booming synthetic life industry. And what's interesting is that this new synthetic life industry is following some of the same questions that the synthetic chemists faced 150 years ago. So here's uh, Drew dealing with questions about monopoly, and I hope you don't mind, but I think they're very 19th century view of monopoly that you have. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, you had a, a booming open source movement um, and a rollback of the patent movement, of, of the patent laws, um, that, that really allowed the industry to take off. Um, within a very short time, however, that itself had been rolled back. In the mid-1970s, a bunch of uh, German companies lobbied for a strong patent law. Um, they used that to build a very strong monopoly, which by 1925 was uh, IG Farben, uh, the fourth largest monopoly in the world. And since that time, the chemical industry has been a highly concentrated and highly powerful industry right through to now. And if you look at BASF, which is uh, one of those original companies, um, it's now the largest chemical company. It's uh, also got a $1.5 billion agreement with Monsanto on GMO seeds, and it's positioned itself at the head of the pack on nanotechnology. So we're moved, in that case, from monopoly to oligopoly. And I think we're going to see this, exactly this, with synthetic biology. Um, that while there's an attempt to build a commons, we're already seeing patents being placed, being written by people like Craig Venter and DuPont, which are being set to crowd out the commons and, and establish a monopoly position. There is going to be a microbe soft of synthetic biology. And uh, I, I salute the attempts to, to kick against that, but I think history is on the side of Craig Venter on this one. Andrew is concerned about militarization, and rightly so. You go back to the history of synthetic chemistry. Back in the 1850s, you had people like Lionel Playfair, a British chemist, saying that you could use chemistry in the Crimean War for, uh, for, for chemical weapons. And uh, this, this caused a real stir. We had uh, at least two treaties trying to ban chemical weapons, but by the time the First World War came around, uh, both the Allies and the Germans were releasing synthetic chlorine into the wind to try and gas their opponents. Two decades later, IG Farben, BASF again, was, uh, was supplying Zyklon B into the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Now, if you'd said to the uh, founders of BASF in the 1860s that their facilities would be used to, to carry out mass murder by their own government, they would have said that was an extreme and improbable thing. But um, the balance of probability changed very quickly across one human lifetime. 
And uh, I really do think that it's a, it's a mistake to think that with synthetic biology, where we already have had agents built that can kill 50 million people, as it did last, last uh, century in the case of 1918 flu virus, that you can, on the one hand, uh, restrain the hostile uses of this technology, and on the other hand, have a booming industry. Um, that really is a fairy tale that high-tech companies and high-tech industries tell their population to try and make them sleep better at night. Um, I think if Drew is serious about disarming the future, you have to realize that the existence of an industry uh, and, and a capac industrial capacity means that they will be commandeered in wartime by states, even states that you think you trust. And uh, the, the way to disarm the future is to disarm the uh, large-scale commercial production of anything using synthetic biology. And I think thirdly, looking back to the chemical industry, there's a clear lesson on economic disruption. Um, you didn't have to wait for uh, soldiers to be killed on the battlefield before there were already economic deaths on the agricultural fields of Turkey, of Mexico, and of India. Um, that in fact, those who grew the natural dyes for the, the dye stuffs industry saw the uh, emergence of a synthetic dye stuffs industry back in the 1860s as an attack on first their livelihoods and later their lives. Um, so in 1897, BASF and Bayer had a synthetic indigo dye, blue, um, which uh, led to the collapse of indigo growing in, in Bengal. 75% of the, the area planted to indigo collapsed uh, within a decade. And then when famine came along, um, all those unemployed, millions of unemployed growers ended up uh, dead. And those are just the sort of first canaries in the coal mine we've uh, seen wave after wave of synthetic products made by chemistry, putting out of work rubber tappers and uh, cotton producers and, and so forth. But I think synthetic biology is probably going to outdo all of that. Um, I mentioned already Jay Kiesling, which is one of Drew's colleagues, um, and he has a project to working with Sanofi Aventis to replace uh, Artemisia, which is usually grown by thousands of small farmers in East Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, and basically to undercut them and put them out of business. Um, but it goes further. When I spoke with Jake Heasling recently, he told me that as far as he was concerned, synthetic biology meant that anything that can be made from a plant can now be made by a microbe in a vat. Think about that. Anything that can be made from a plant can now be made by a microbe in a vat. A statement like that, if it's true, is the death knell for economies that depend on plant-derived commodities, whether that's tropical oils or fibers or rubber or uh, plant extracts for pharmaceuticals and flavorings and so forth. Um, what Jay Kiesling's statement means is that for the customers of those commodity-dependent countries, which are usually the poorest countries in the world, they can now dangle the carrots or the concern of synthetic biology and then renegotiate costs, they can renegotiate trade deals, they can switch to microbial synthesis and leave whole nations up in the air, um, potentially to spiral into hunger, violence, and unrest. So monopoly, militarization, massive economic destruction, three things that we can already see from the beginning of this and the last synthetic industry. But the real doozy with synthetic chemistry came a full century later. And that's in 1962, when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring and drew back the curtain on a host of unexpected toxicities of what was thought to be the good side of synthetic chemistry, the pesticides, the paints, the fertilizers, the refrigerants, and so forth, the whole better living through chemistry package. And for showing that tremendous cost that those benefits were paid for by, she uh, was called emotional, unscientific, she was called a fear monger, all these sort of labels that today get put on people who are critical of biotechnology. Um, but she really didn't even have a part of it. Some years after Rachel Carson's death, Drew and I are now part of a generation with the lowest sperm count in history, under a, a depleted ozone layer, and every night my wife feeds my child breast milk with persistent organic pollutants in. And we're the privileged ones. For communities of color and poor communities in the shadow of chemical facilities, the attack of the synthetic chemical industry on their lives and their health is something more like a slow genocide. Which is not to say synthetic biology is going to be toxic, but it is to say we need to properly weigh that which we do not know, and we need to take it extremely serious. And that's been discussed on this stage before. It's the uh, black swan that Nassim Taleb talks about, or Paul Sappho's cone of uncertainty.